We present Marjorie Westbury as Gabriel Ivory, Patrick Barr as Dolly Godolphin, Monica Gray as Francis Ivory, with Duncan McIntyre in Black Plumes. A play for radio by Felix Felton and Susan Ashman from the novel by Marjorie Allingham. Black Plumes. My dear Francis, this is a very charming surprise. What has brought you all the way up here? I'm worried, Granny. I wanted to talk to you. Oh, I'm an old woman, my dear, nearly 90. It's not much use coming to me. When's your father coming back from China? Well, not for a month or two, and I must talk to someone. Well, what's the matter? Trouble at the gallery? Yes. I don't wonder with Robert Madrigal left in charge... I never liked that young man. And why your insane stepsister married him, I can't imagine. How is he behaving? Well, he and Phyllida are staying with me at number 38. Are they indeed? Whose idea was that? Father's. He wanted Robert to be near the gallery. So Phyllida's at 38, is she? Merrick didn't tell me that. You're finding it difficult to live with her, I suppose. I don't blame you. She is a bit neurotic. That's putting it mildly. What has she done now? Darling, it's not, Phyllida. I only wish it were. Granny, there's something going on. Oh, there always was. Yes, I know. But this is different. Things are being deliberately broken and destroyed. The staff's going to pieces. Peterson, the old commissioner, has resigned. And even Miss Dorset's on the verge of it. Well, you can't blame them. Now, look here, my dear. You leave business to men. When I was your age, we thought it rather indelicate for females to understand business. That was imbecile, of course. But we were saved a lot of unpleasantness. You ought to be thinking about getting married. Phyllida has no children. Mercy, of course, if there's anything in heredity. But someone must carry on. Come and talk to me about marriage, not business. All right, then. Robert has just told me I ought to marry Henry Luca. Luca? Wasn't that the little man who was rescued from Godolphin's expedition? Yes. But I thought he was a baggage man in charge of the camels, or, or was it mules? <laughs> oh, no, darling. Don't be fair. Well, he did go out as Robert's batman, but that's nothing to do with it, and he's in the firm now. I just don't like him. But did this person have the impudence to ask you to marry him? Well, there was nothing impudent about it, darling. Why shouldn't he? Even if he is a bit of a smart aleck. Why? Don't be a fool, girl. Your mother left you 200,000 pounds. That is a fortune. This camel man is presuming. Oh, but surely... I shall speak to Merrick when he returns. Are you staying for tea? No, thank you. I'd better get back to the gallery. Miss Dorset doesn't know where I am. All right, then. Dorothea will show you out. And for heaven's sake, take a firm line with this nasty little camel man. And with Robert as well. Oh, Miss Francis, thank heavens you've come back. Hello, Miss Dorset. What's the trouble? Trouble? A, a picture's been slashed, that's all. Slashed? Yes, I've been nearly frantic. Which picture is it? One of Mr. Fields. The big portrait of the Mexican dancer, number 64. Is David here? Indeed he is. He's upstairs with Mr. Roberts and Mr. Luca now. Who discovered it? Old Formby. He says he went into the big gallery at two o'clock to speak to Mr. Robert, who was there with Mr. Luca, and everything was all right then... When they came out about 15 minutes later, he went back again and found the damage. Does he actually say that no one else was there except Robert and Luca and that they were together? He does. But doesn't he see what that means? Don't ask me. I've worked for your father since I was 17. And it's a shame to see his wonderful old firm floundering in the hands of a lunatic, if nothing worse. I've never said such an indiscreet thing in my life, but it's the truth and someone's got to see it. Don't worry yourself, Miss Dorset. I'll go upstairs and listen to what's going on. Madrigal. Can your people downstairs patch it up? How long are they likely to be about it? Mr. Field, you can rely on us, absolutely. I can't tell you how shocked and horrified we are that this should have happened to a picture in our care. Uh, Mr. Luca here agrees with me. Don't give it a thought, Mr. Fields. We'll patch it up for you. It may be out of the show for a day or two, but uh, that can't be helped, can it? You're insured, of course. Yes, uh, naturally we are, fully. But in view of the particular circumstances, I mean, in view of the slightness of the damage, I think a claim might hold up repair work unnecessarily. After all, the main thing is to get the picture back on show. Yes, I suppose so. 
Look here, Madrigal, exactly what sort of an accident was it? I have no idea. No idea at all. Uh, all right. I'm probably a fool, but get it repaired and back in its place by the end of the week, and we'll forget the incident. But meanwhile, for the love of Mike, do look after the stuff. These things are painted in blood and sweat. I can't let them be carved up indiscriminately. Quite, quite. North is upstairs arranging for it to be taken down. Perhaps you'd go up to him, Luca, and impress on him that he must take every possible care. Oh, very well. Ah, it's a terrible thing to have happened. Terrible. Why, it's Miss Ivory. I didn't see you. Now, you're turning up as quite cheered up by afternoon. Mind you, wait. I'll be down in a minute. Hello, Francis. Robert. You met Mr. Field, haven't you? Oh, I should hope so. She was my first client. I painted her when she was 14. The fee Merrick paid me got me to the United States. Hence my career. Hello, Francis, love. Hello, David. I'm very depressed. Someone's been sticking knives into my beautiful senorita. It's the uh, insult that gets one down. Hey, what are you doing now? Come out and have a sherry. It's too early. Oh, is it? I can't get used to my hometown again after years of freedom. Well, never mind. Let's go and eat ice cream. There's nothing I'd like better. Fine. We'll go now before a little consequential return, shall we? I, I didn't think you'd be going out, Francis. Oh, but I am, Robert. I don't get a sound offer of ice cream every day. <laughs> shall we go? Poor woman, she's starving. <laughs> Righto, ducky. Do you think you can bear up until we get across the road? What's going on at your place? How do you mean? Either Phyllida's husband or that painful little excrescence with the ginger hair stuck a penknife into one of my best paintings. I may be fussy, but I don't like it. Neither would I. What's up? The ginger twerp has something on Robert, has he? Blackmail, you mean? Well, I don't know. I don't suppose Robert did the knifing himself. And when one chap covers up another with such desperate determination, the evil thought has a way of cropping up. Had any other trouble? Oh, heavens, yes. A Kangsi vase has been broken and a royal catalogue destroyed. Mm. number of things. And each one's been a little more serious than the last. Mm. It's not good, old girl. In fact, it's damn disturbing. You're all pretty sure that Ginger is the man. Oh, yes, I think so. He's horrible. Well, who is he? Where did he come from? He went with Robert on Godolphin's Tibetan expedition. Ah, good Lord, yes, I remember. The secret climb through the Himalayan pass. I read about it at the time. They were very interested in it in the States. Robert and Luca were the only two to return. Oh, well, that accounts for it. Ginger probably saved Robert's life or something. Godolphin disappeared, didn't he? Yes, he'd broken his leg. And rather than encumber the other two, he disappeared during the night. They were at the edge of a ravine. A wonderful chap, old Dolly. Nobody but he could have persuaded your father to put up money for an expedition like that. But I can't exactly see Robert on that kind of adventure. It's odd, isn't it? The lamb returns and the lion is left to bleach in the sun. Poor old Dolly. He'd have reveled in your present situation, by the way. Did you ever meet him? I saw quite a lot of him during the school holidays my last year. He and Phyllida ran round together quite a bit. Ah, so they did. Your half-sister believed in numbers. Yes, but Robert stuck. The others drifted. Godolphin got lost, but Robert stuck. He would. He's a sort of nervy determination about him that really frightens me. Frightens you? Why? Robert wants me to marry Luca. Marry Ginger? I know it's absurd, but he has such an uncanny way of getting what he wants that I sometimes feel I might go mad and do it. This isn't serious, is it? I shouldn't stand for it. It's damned insulting. Robert's nuts, of course. Luca's such a little tick. Horrible. He makes a bit of a nuisance of himself, I suppose. That type can. They're unsnubbable. You don't like to go away, of course, because of the trouble. Francis, my love, you're in a mess. I'm afraid I am, rather. You know what you'd better do? What? Get engaged. That'll scotch all that nonsense till medic returns. Betrothal is old-fashioned, I know, but it has its virtues, like flannel. Any likely lad about? <laughs> no one I could ask. It ought to be someone you know, or it might lead to marriage. When's your father due home? January or February. Yeah, a long time. Phyllida's just her own sweet self, I take it? Just about. Yeah. Well, suppose I take you out now and buy you a ring. What did you say? Well, not a violently expensive one, just uh, decent enough to show the relation. Any good? Are you serious? Yeah, perfectly. And let's be clear about one thing. I'm not asking you to marry me, and I don't suppose I ever shall. Oh. No, you see, there's the question of money. I'm very sensitive about it. I once nearly killed an old woman who suggested I was a fortune hunter. Oh, nonsense. Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> now, joking apart... 
I don't go back to America until April. So if you'd care for an engagement ring, we'll go out and buy one. What about it? Well, it would certainly settle one of my difficulties till father gets home. Oh, but it seems such a frightful imposition. Anything to oblige an old client. That's a bet, then. We'll buy the ring, write to the newspapers and tell the family. When the time comes, we can quarrel about the ballet or something. Meanwhile, stick to the story. That's the main point. Uh, you won't be upsetting anybody. Meaning? Oh, any other woman. Oh, Lord, no. I'm free, unattached and unbeloved. I've never even been engaged before. The old man's a frightful cad at heart. He always slithers out of it in the end. I'm banking on your nice bringing up. None of the objects of my adoration has ever got a hooks in me. Why? Was it always money? Huh? Oh, yes, money. That uh, and other things. Come on. You'll have to have an aquamarine with those eyes. Good evening, Norris. Any messages? Well, I, I don't know if you were expecting her, but old Mrs. Ivory's here. Granny? Here at 38? Uh, yes, miss. Uh, she came about an hour ago. Where is she now? In Mr. Merrick's room, miss. Her maid's looking after her. But, well, why has she gone up there? Oh, she had words with Mr. Madrigal, miss. Uh, where's Mr. Madrigal now? Uh, he's in the garden room. Right. I'll go and see him, darling, and get it over. Uh, Mrs. Madrigal said, would you go and see her when you came in, miss? I'm afraid she's very put out. All right, then. Uh, you cope with Robert, darling. I'll go up and let Phyllida cry on my shoulder. Oh, Francis, it's all your fault. You asked Granny to come here. How could you? I did nothing of the kind. But you went to see her. She said so. Why did you have to go and upset her? Well, I never dreamt she'd come down here. She's so terrifyingly old. Oh, she's as strong as a horse. Which, thank goodness, I had her strength. When she came in on old Dorothea's arm, she positively dominated the house. Was Robert rude to her? Well, naturally, he protested. I did myself. There was a terrible scene. Oh, I shall be a rag tomorrow. What did Granny do? Oh, just let Robert rage. He said the most unforgivable things and then simply sat down and sent Dorothea to prepare Merrick's bedroom for her. But what could one do? She said it had been her room for 30 years and she was going to bed in it. Well, there was nothing to say. I thought Robert was going to faint. It's all your fault, Francis. You may have killed her. What's that ring? My engagement ring. I'm going to marry David. Marry David? But, Francis, you're out of your mind. Whatever will Robert say? I don't know. David's telling him now. But Robert's made up his mind you shall marry Luca. Then I'm afraid he's doomed to disappointment, my dear. Oh, as if we hadn't troubles enough, and you know what Robert's like when he's thwarted. It's no business of Robert's who I marry. Francis, have you ever thought that Robert might be mad? Why do you say that? Oh, nothing. I'm ill and nervy. I hate this insufferable house. I've only been married to him two years. He's always been... Odd and difficult, but just lately he's been much worse and he's getting worse every day. Lost all control talking to Granny. And when he hears about David, oh, for goodness sake, go down. They've both got insane tempers. Well, go on. Perhaps I'd better. Will he be all right? Oh, don't worry about me. Dorothea, how's Granny? I can't do a thing with her, Miss Frances. She's brooding. I haven't seen her like it since Mr. Merrick's first wife, Miss Phillida's mother, ran off and left him. She's angry and she's old. I wondered, should I send for a doctor? I don't see what good he could do. Well, I'll wait a bit and see how she is later. I'll go down in a minute and get her a mite of hot milk. She may take that and go to sleep. Mr. Robert has upset her. Oh, they make me wild, these nervy men. There's something very wrong in this house. I notice it if you don't. Something very wrong. Yes? Who is it? It's me, David. I took a chance on finding the right room. Oh, come in. No, thanks. I'm just on my way. I only wanted to tell you that we're still engaged. Oh, what's the matter? What's happened? Oh, nothing. It's all okay in spite of our Robert's unendearing manners. He's going off for a walk, by the way. It's not a bad idea. The night air may cool him down a bit. What did he say? Just about what you'd think. Forget him. We're engaged. Good night. Good morning, Miss Francis. No signs of Mr. Robert this morning. Really? No, Miss. He's not been in the house all night, and his coat and hat are missing. 
Shall I send his letters down to his club? It's uh, what I usually do. Good morning, madam. Mr. Robert's not at his club, and he's not at the Surrey house or the Palace flat. Where is he, Francis? Where is he? It's nearly a week now. Why doesn't he get in touch? What's happened? What's happened? <gasps> Francis, look. Look at the headlines. Godolphin's been saved. Famous explorer escapes from forbidden territory. Never mind Godolphin. Bellida, something's happened. Happened? You've got to pull yourself together, darling. You've got to be incredibly brave and oh, oh, for goodness sake, keep your head. They found Robert. Yes. Did you know? Look, I, I, I don't know anything. Where is he? What's he done? He. He's been down in the garden room all the time. Garden room? His hat and coat were there, too, lying on top of him. That cupboard's never opened, you know. There's nothing in it in the ordinary way. They just found him. Norris called me. Francis, are you telling me that Robert is dead? Yes. Thank God. <laughs> here yet? Yes, darling. To think of the police tramping about in this house. Does Norris know how the man died? No. He just found him propped up there with his hat and coat on his knees. Who was the last to leave the house that night? David Field? No. Someone went out after him. How do you know? Because I heard the latch click when he went. And then about ten minutes later, someone walked sharply down the passage from the garden room and went out of the front door. Oh, and Granny... Luca was in the house that night. I met him when I went down to the garden room. When you went down to the garden room? I went down to see how David and Robert were getting on together. I met Luca coming away from there. Oh, he was angry about something and quite insufferable. I went on down the passage, but the door was shut and I didn't like to go barging in, so I, I went down into the yard. Uh, and looked up through the window? Yes. Very sensible. Just what I should have done myself. And what did you see? Oh, they were just talking, you know. You saw them both? Yes, I did. Are you in love? No, I don't think so. Oh, I don't know. They say it's unlucky to marry for love. Some country saying, I think, is very true. Did you see Field again that night? Yes. He came up to my room to say that we were still engaged and that Robert was going for a walk. To your bedroom? Yes, darling. Quite like a servant girl. Listen, there's someone coming across the landing. I don't think so. Yes, there is, my dear child. I haven't slept in this room for 30 years of my life without getting to know it. Open the door. Miss Dorset. I didn't like to knock in case she was asleep. Can I speak to you, please? Oh, yes, of course. Um, it's Miss Dorset, darling. I'll be back in a minute. Miss Ivory, what am I to do about the reporters? The gallery ought to issue some sort of statement. Well, can't Mr. Luca do it? He hasn't turned up yet. It's late, isn't it? Nearly half past twelve. I phoned his house, but he left there at nine. I don't know where he is. Well, get hold of him as soon as you can. The police will want to see him. Then it was, was it? I heard something, but I didn't like to ask any more. Who? We don't know. They're finding out now. Miss Ivory, are you, you sure Mr. Robert couldn't have done it himself? I don't think so. Robert was nervy, but he wasn't suicidal. Wasn't he? What do you mean? Didn't he ever talk to you about the whistle on the telephone? Whistle? <laughs> he didn't. Then don't mention it, for heaven's sake. It's probably nothing at all. I ought not to have said anything. I'm so upset today, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll go back to the gallery. Well, just a minute. You sound as if you thought Robert was insane. Oh, I did wonder. So would you have done, if you'd known him as well as I did. Hello, hello. Am I interrupting a conference? No, Mr. Field, indeed you're not. I'm just going back to the gallery. Oh. Excuse me. Well, Duchess, how are the nerves? The nerves? They want to see you downstairs. They've just finished with me. What did they ask you? Robert was murdered, was he? Looks like it, Ducky. But have no fear. The head narc is a nice old Scot. He talked to me like a father. I find myself yearning to confide my secret inhibitions. 
By the way, do you recollect performing a girl guide act of mercy on my hand with a bottle of iodine last week? Yes. Why? Now look at my hand now. Gone without trace. Ever heard of Coriolanus? Who? Coriolanus, a hellishly noble Roman. He was touchy about displaying his wounds. I'm just like him. I thought I'd mention it. Forget the incident entirely, will you? But I don't... Go on, down you go. Never keep a narc waiting. Not even a nice one. Miss Frances Ivory? Yes? Allow me to introduce myself. Divisional Detective Inspector Brady. How do you do? I'm jolly pleased to meet you. Uh, won't you take a chair? Oh, thank you. That's it. Uh, I don't want a statement from you yet, but I'd just like a wee word with you if the time's convenient. Well, certainly. I understand you went down to the yard on the night of the crime. How do you know? Your granny's old maid told me. Dorothea? Aye, that's her name, I believe, yes. What else did she tell you? I'd prefer the story from you. All right. I did come down that night. I didn't like to interrupt Robert and David by going into the room, so I looked through the window. Uh -huh. And what did you see? David and Robert talking. You're certain you saw both men? Yes. Just talking? Yes. Uh, now, have you heard how the deceased was killed? No. He was killed by a jab in the chest, passing between the fourth and fifth ribs and piercing the heart bag. It must have been a long blade, approximately half an inch wide. Now, can you think of any weapon in this house that might answer the description? No, I, no, I can't say I can. And I suppose you can't help us about this blackamoor. Blackamoor? Aye. Molly, the maid, swears a black fellow darted through the yard that night. You didn't see him yourself? Oh, no, indeed, I didn't. Uh, Molly's been reading too many novels, I'm thinking. Uh, by the way, there's one wee point I forgot. Besides the stab wound, there was a contusion on the back of the poor chap's head and another on his chin. The one on his chin was likely made by a blow from a fist and was delivered with such violence that there's a likelihood that the assailant's hand was damaged. Have you seen a barked set of knuckles in the neighborhood recently? No, I haven't. Ah, well, I'll not detain you now. Never concern yourself about me. I'll just be in and out all the time. Good morning, Miss Ivory. Good morning, Miss Dorset. Have you found Mr. Luca yet? No, that's what I came across to tell you. He's gone. Gone? Yes. I got onto his flat as early as I dared this morning, and he's still not back. He walked out just before nine yesterday morning, and he hasn't been seen since. Oh, there's only one explanation that comes to mind, isn't there? Oh, please, please, let it be true. The police are after him already. The servant told me there'd been a man hanging about the place all night. Well, I'm not surprised. I never liked him. But it doesn't seem possible, does it? Oh, I was so frightened for you yesterday. For me? Yes. He's such a nice young man, isn't he? I've admired his painting for years. Oh, I never thought David had anything to do with it. Oh, of course you didn't, my dear. No one could have expected you to. I... I haven't had a reply to my china cable yet. Your father really is needed here. There's no one in authority left at all next door except me. Oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to tell you. This news about Luca put it out of my head. Oh. We heard last night. Where from? Alexandria. That is coming by plane this morning. He'll be here tomorrow. But how did he... Apparently, Gabrielle wired him last week after I went out to see her. Tomorrow? That is good news. Oh, it's a terrible homecoming, of course. Poor man, what a shock. Still, I shall be relieved to see him. Good morning, all. Oh, you both seem very pleased with yourselves. It's the wonderful news. Mr. Ivory will be here tomorrow. And Lucas run for it. Well, there's a double event, if you like. That calls for a celebration, my love. I'll take you out to lunch. Oh, I don't think we ought to. Oh, cheerio, Miss Dorset. My good girl, you can't hang about this ghastly house day in and day out. You'll get as hysterical as Philida. We'll go to the Biarritz. And perhaps you'd like to marry me afterwards. Why? The iodine stain hand. By the laws of England, no wife can give evidence against her husband. Oh. You asked for it, sweetheart. Now, no more arguments. We go out at a quarter to one, and don't keep me waiting. <laughs> Sorry, darling. That was a reporter. I had to cope with him. What did you do? Oh, gave him a signed confession and the commissioner's hat. What's the matter? Your cheeks are tingling. I've just been given the cut direct. Who by? Margaret Fisher Sprague at the corner table. She's on several committees with Daddy. I nodded to her and she looked straight through me. What, that old trout in the wide awake? Mm. Oh, never mind about her. Think of her in the nude. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell you Godolphin will be home on Thursday? Godolphin? Yes, the one and only Dolly. 
He rang Phillida this morning. Where from? I don't know. Basra or somewhere like that. I warn you, Duchess, there are storms ahead. Button down your sou'wester and keep your chin in. What do you mean? Well, surely you haven't forgotten what he's like. A colourful bird. This sensational return from death is typical. If there's any stirring up to be done, Dolly's the man to do it. And talking of stirring up, where the hell are those waiters? Oh, Miss Ivory, I'm so glad you're back. There's terrible news. Why? What's happened now? Mr. Merrick is held up at Brindisi. Oh. What's the trouble? A case of yellow fever on the plane. They're all in quarantine. That means he'll be there for a fortnight at least. He sounded so upset on the telephone. Had he heard about Robert's death? Mm. He just read about it in the papers. I thought he was going to have a stroke, poor man. What a frightful homecoming for him then. Oh, Mr. Field, Mrs. Madrigal sent down word that you were going to see, see to everything with Mr. Worthington. That's the solicitor. You mean about the funeral? Yes, I'm so glad. Mm. I'd have done it, of course, but these things do need a man. Uh, I don't know why. All right, then. I'll go down and see Worthington now. You'll want it all very quiet, naturally. Oh, I think so. Mm. Old Mrs. Ivory must be consulted, but uh, I should think as quiet as possible. I'll go and ask her, unless you'd like to, Miss Francis. Uh, no, uh, no, you go, will you? I'll come up later. I want to word with Mr. Field. Just as you say. Phillida asked me, you know. Someone's got to do it for the poor girl. It's a horrible job. Look here, David. This entire business has got hopelessly out of hand. Oh, I was only trying to be useful. I'm talking about us. Oh, wouldn't you like to call the engagement joke off? Well, I think you'd better. You saw what happened at lunch today. We're going to be the Piccadilly lepers. You clear right out of it. I'd like to. There's nothing I'd rather do. Oh, uh, very well, then. Go. <laughs> Darling, you're lovely. All elementary and untrodden and violets down the path. It's disgustingly rare and painfully attractive. As a rule, this is the point where the old cad packs up. However, just take a look out of the window. See him? Boots and all. If I leave this house, he goes too. This is a solemn moment. For the first time in his life, the old man's trapped, Duchess. If he wasn't there, you'd go? You bet I would. Miss Francis, you'd better come and see your grandmother yourself. She doesn't agree with our ideas at all. All right. I'll go up now. Shall I come with you? I suppose so. Francis, why have you brought Mr. Field? Phillida has asked him to look after things. I disapprove strongly. I'll stand down then. And it's too late. If your name has been mentioned to the solicitors, it will cause less talk if you go on with it. There's bound to be talk in any case. That's why we all thought that a quiet funeral... Quiet? A quiet funeral at a time like this? Don't be ridiculous. It was only because of all the scandal. My dear child, we don't admit that there is any scandal. Our poor, wretched relation has died. And we owe it to ourselves to see him buried in the right way. There will be all these crowds round the house. Then for heaven's sake, give them something to stare at. Worthington will know the proper undertaker. And tell him we'll have no truck with these tawdry little modern motor hearses. Robert's hearse shall be drawn by six properly accoutred black horses with black plumes on their heads. Very kind. Goodbye, Mr. Goodbye, Mrs. Ivory. Goodbye. Oh, thank heaven they've all gone. At least they paid you the compliment of coming. Most of the people you asked just sent wreaths. Granny was right, you know. Those horses were a magnificent sight. The undertaker told me he hadn't had those plumes out since before the war. Phillida behaved uncommonly well. Phillida can always be relied on to play a part. Today, it was dignified grief. Sorrow, dear? Granny's going upstairs, I think. Oh, wait a minute. Here's Norris. Looking a bit anxious. <clears throat> Mrs. Ivory, Mr. Godolphin is here. Godolphin? Oh, Mr. Godolphin, show him in. Certainly, madam. Be ready for a shock. What he's been through doesn't make people look any younger. The paper said he was lame. Mr. Godolphin. My God. Oh, forgive me, I've chosen quite the wrong time to arrive. Your man told me the news on the doorstep. I'm just off the plane, haven't seen a paper, or spoken, spoken to herself. Came straight to Philadelphia, naturally. Naturally? Why, naturally, Mr. Godolphin. Uh, Philander, my dear, is it still a secret? Oh. Ah, I see it is. Well, are we to share this secret? Certainly. Philander's my wife. We were married just before I went abroad. Still 
in the breakfast room. It's 40 minutes now. Do you think we ought to go in? Leave them. They are the two people it concerns. They'll come back when they're ready. You knew about this, Mr. Field. Yes, I did. I was a witness at the wedding. Phillida said it had to be done in secret because Dolly was broke or something equally undesirable. So along I went. It was just before I went back to America. But when you returned and found her married to Robert. I held my tongue. It was her affair, not mine. And as Dolly was dead, there was nothing in it. I did come and see her last week and implored her to get hold of Dolly and tell him. But when he telephoned, she funked it. So where do we go from here? You have to see reason. After all, it's quite clear how the thing happened. Listen, they're coming. Come on, Belinda. They're all here. Well? It's ghastly. There's only one thing to be done. I've been explaining that to my wife. We must all pull together and get this mystery cleared up, and then she and I must start afresh. How very sensible. And what will you do while the police are finishing their inquiries? Go abroad again? No, dear lady. I've just spent three years in a filthy lamasserized cell, or correction cell, as they're pleased to call it, thinking of my home and my wife, and believe me, I'm not going to lose either of them again. I see. And what do you suggest? That we get on with the work at once and see the whole hopeless affair settled. Since it principally affects me, I'll do it myself. He doesn't understand. He wants to stay in the house. That is out of the question. I don't think so. Here you are, a house full of women, completely at the mercy of the police. Your solicitor appears to be worse than useless. Field can't do much because he has no authority and isn't even a permanent resident in the country. You must have somebody to manage things. There's absolutely no reason why I shouldn't stay here as a guest and do what I can to clear things up. But, my dear chap, use your imagination. Don't ignore what's happened. Philida married Robert in all good faith, and he's barely in his grave. I realize that. That's the one thing I do realize. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you forget. Where I've been rotting slowly out of existence, the niceties have been absent. I don't care if the thing's good form or if it's socially dangerous. I want to take Philida away. She's my wife, remember, not Robert's. If she won't come or can't come away with me till this blasted mystery is cleared up, then I'll clear it up and no one on earth will get in my way. Is that plain enough? If you won't have me in the house, Mrs. Ivory, I'll stay in the nearest hotel. But if you've any sense, you'll use me, not frustrate me. Thank you for your kind offer. Yes, Mr. Godolphin, we shall be very pleased if you will consider yourself my son's guest for a few days. Thank you. You will behave like a guest, of course. You're very wise. Yes, I'll behave. Oh, I'm very tired. Oh, now, Dorothea, I'll come presently, but not yet. First of all, there is something I have to say to all of you. I am an old woman. Half the time, my mind wanders abominably. But at this particular time, I think I may be saying things more vividly than any of you because I have one great advantage. I am a part. My life is at an end. I do not care what happens to me or to anyone else. What are you trying to tell us, Granny? Simply this. You have all developed one great weakness during the past hour. You all share a secret, previously only known to Philida and Mr. Field. Our uh, marriage, you mean? Yes, Mr. Godolphin, your marriage. Somehow or other, you have all got to keep this secret from the police. I don't agree. I'm against secrets. If we hadn't kept our marriage a secret, this wretched complication would never have cropped up. I say, tell the police. Regardless of consequences? What consequences can there be? As far as I can find out from Philida, poor old Robert must have died last Monday week, just about the time when I was lying under a mass of stinking goatskins being smuggled over the border in a mule train. As Robert died, I came to life. Philida never had two husbands at once, so where's the immorality? Surely the police are human and reasonable. No, darling, no, 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 don't tell them. Why ever not? You don't know. You, you don't understand. I think Robert guessed about it. You and me in the last six months have been hell, absolute hell. You see, Mr. Godolphin, Philida should not be allowed to talk, should she? Anyone can see what's happened to Philida. Robert happened to mention my name by chance one day, and that started up a neurosis. Look at her, poor darling. She's a mass of hysteria now and must have been for months. You can take me up now, Dorothea. My dear Mr. Godolphin, don't forget one thing. The police are very unimaginative. You must be careful. Given that story, they might almost consider poor Philida had a motive, mightn't they? Your arm, Dorothea. Brady here. 
Randall here, sir. We've got him. You have, have you, jolly good. And what's he like? Cocky, sir. Ah, I thought he might be. Bring him along. Right, sir. The train goes in seven minutes. We'll be with you before five. Ah. Uh -huh. Good morning, sir. No, oh, good morning, with it. Any result? Oh, nothing, sir. Not a black man seen for miles. No one saw him except this Molly, and she's said to be a little weak in the head. I'll go on following it up, of course. That's right. Any luck in your other direction? I'm keeping an eye on the lad. He's staying away from the house and amusing himself, but we'll let him bide for an hour or two. Ah, yeah. He's costing the country a mint in shoe leather, but it can't be helped. Hello? Hello, Duchess. Is that you? David! Why on earth haven't you been round? Huh? Why haven't you been round? Oh, funk, I suppose. Will you come out and eat with me tonight? Oh, it, it's so embarrassing. Yeah, but I rather thought we ought to meet. A gossip writer phoned me this morning to ask if our engagement was still on. Oh? What did you say? I was very upstage. Now put on a nice blue dress and I'll fetch you at 7.30. Gabrielle says we're all to wear black for a month. Does she indeed? Good for her. Have you got a black evening dress? Yes. 7.30 then. I like the dress, darling. It's just right in this studied pretentiousness. Do stop looking around like a hunted fawn, then. I'm sorry, Dave. Don't worry. There's not a soul in this room who can spare a second to recognize anyone but themselves. That's the strength of this age, individualism. Excuse me, sir. Hello, what's this? A note for me? From the table in the alcove, sir. Hmm. Well, I'll be jiggered. What is it? Dolly and Phyllida would like us to join them for a drink. Oh, he hasn't brought her here. He has, the blithering idiot. What do they think they want? Oh, I don't know. Let's go and see. Do sit down, will you? Very queer you should have decided to come to just this one restaurant, isn't it? I don't think so. We probably chose it for the same reason. It's not overcrowded with our particular set. I think you're both mad to come anyway. Cigarette? No, thanks. That's rather a sensational diamond, Phyllis. That's new, isn't it? Dolly bought it. Dolly, you are nuts. You'll get the girl arrested. Now listen to me, Field. I was going to talk to you tomorrow, but we could have it out here better than anywhere else. Francis ought to be in it, too. What's the trouble? This is straight. You can be absolutely frank with us. There's nothing we won't do for you, but we must have this thing settled. Did you kill Robert? My dear chap. That's not an answer. When you're fit to walk without that stick, I'll be happy to oblige you. I take it you're asking for horseplay. You still haven't answered me. No, Dolly. I did not kill him. You were the last person who could possibly have been with him. You came out of the garden room and told Francis he was going for a walk. That's common knowledge. I did. I thought he was going out. Damn it, I fetched his hat and coat from the hall for him. You fetched his hat and coat? Yes, I did. Oh, don't be so damn dramatic about it. I fetched his hat and coat and chucked them on the table for him. Why? Because he asked me to. Do you honestly expect anyone to believe that? No. That's why I didn't mention it before. But that's what happened. David, we're all on your side. We all know what Robert was, and we all know you're inclined to lose your head when you get in a temper. Give us a chance to get behind you. Why on earth should I have killed him? Suppose you were having this back chat with him, and suppose he said something that got under your skin. Suppose you suddenly saw him with that conceited leer on that lantern mug and his grey lock flapping in his eyes, and you felt what a damn silly pompous ass he was, and you suddenly let him have it. Suppose you told him about his wife. You knew, remember. And then... When you realized what you'd done and how he was going to take it, you lost your head, as you do, you know, and killed him. With a toothpick, I suppose. There used to be an old spike file in that desk in there, so Norris says. He can't remember when it disappeared. Whatever it was, you, you had a week to get rid of it. Imaginative little beggar, aren't you? If you'll be reasonable, I'll back you to the limit. Coming, Francis? I'm sorry. You could have trusted us. Coming? I'm afraid Master Godolphin put a bit of a damper on the evening. What do you think after all that? I don't. You don't what? Think I'm guilty or think at all? I don't think anything except that I love you. That's a blow below the belt, Duchess. 
Do you mean it? Yeah. Darling, this is dangerous. Don't go and do it. Don't please, sweet. You don't know anything about it. It's all right for me, but not for you. You're so new. Do you love me? For my sins. I hit him. That's what happened. Luca was there to begin with, but I pitched him out and he went off like a streak. Uh, that must have been when you met him, Tenish. Yes, that was the time. He looked furious. No, not so much as I did. Robert was livid himself, unfortunately. He said something quite unpardonable and I hit him very hard. I barked my knuckles on his chin. He went down like a tree. He lay there goggling at me and I stood looking down at him for quite a long time. I know. I saw you. Did you? Where from? The yard? Yes. But I told everyone I saw you and Robert talking. It seemed safer. Ah, I see. Well, when he recovered, he was awfully worried about his face. He kept saying, what will the servants think? Like a parrot. Until I nearly hit him again. Finally, I went and got his hat and coat for him with the idea of carting him down to a doctor to get him patched up. I told him to put them on while I came up and said goodnight to you. Well, that was all right as far as it went. But when I came down again, I heard him talking inside the room. Well, I assumed that Luca had come back. And a deep feeling of no enthusiasm for them both descended on me. So I thought, oh, what the hell, and pushed off. When he didn't show up in the morning, I took it for granted he was hiding somewhere, getting his face presentable. Why didn't you tell them all this? Who, Dolly? No, the police. Oh, it wouldn't have been a good idea, would it? Luca had brought the entire boiling down on his head by clearing up. You weren't trying to shield Luca. No, naturally not. But I saw no point in going into a long story about what Robert had said and why I was irritated. In fact, you were shielding me. <laughs> oh, Duchess, if you make a hero of me, you're going to come such a howling cropper. I don't think I care very much about that. I don't believe you do. Heaven help us both. Oh, excuse me, Miss Ivory. Excuse me, sir. Oh. Hello, officer. What can we do for you? I'm extremely sorry to disturb you. Now, that's all right. We were just coming in. Uh, there's a message from Detective Inspector Bridey, miss. He's very sorry to bother you, but he'd be most grateful if you'd step down to headquarters for a minute. At this time of night? Well, it sounds funny, I know, but he asked specially. I was to say it won't be for long. It's only regulation. Well, that's that. Better get going. <laughs> Well, this is a fine time to ask you to come and see me. Did you think you were coming to jail? Hmm? <laughs> well, sit down, both of you, and don't take any notice of that poor chap in the corner. He jolly well has to sit there and take down any jewelry that may drop from my lips. What's the trouble, Inspector? Oh, you'll just think I'm a fussy old person, particularly as I'm going to ask the young lady something I've asked her before. But uh, I won't keep you long, Miss Ivory. You'll be in your bed in half an hour. Now... Would you just repeat exactly what you did on the night your poor brother-in-law... Oh, pardon me, half-brother-in-law was last seen alive? I was talking to Phyllida. Then I met Dorothea on the landing, and then I came downstairs. Now, what time would that be? Just about ten. Then I passed Mr. Luca in the hall. Uh, wait a minute. You're sure you passed Mr. Luca at that time? Perfectly sure. And then what? I went down to the yard. And what did you see? I saw David and Robert talking. Just talking? Yes. Talking. Ah, well, that's a fine stroke of luck for Mr. Luca. What on earth do you mean? Mr. Luca has returned to this bonny island. Luca's come back? Yes. We picked him up at Plymouth this morning, and we've got him here now. He's a lucky man. Fortunately for him, there was a good, conscientious woman working late at the gallery that night, and she can tell how he came in for his hat and coat and how they walked to the tube together and took a train. We know his movements after that. The woman gives him a grand alibi. Miss Dorset? Aye, that's she. She's an honest, sensible woman, isn't she? Oh, yes, she's all right. She's absolutely cast iron. There we are, then. Mr. Luca can sleep in his own house tonight. And it seems that you, Mr. Field, were the last one to see Mr. Madrigal alive. Good morning, Miss Francis. Some letters have been left by hand. This one's yours, and uh, this one's for you, Mr. Godolphin. Hmm? Same handwriting. Who are the others for? Old Mrs. Ivory, sir, and Mrs. Madrigal. And there are also two for Miss Dorset and Mr. Field. 
uh, with instructions for immediate forwarding. Uh, what's all this about? Behrman's is from Luca. Glad if you'd give me your attention for half an hour at three o'clock in Merrick's office at the gallery. Yours the same, Francis? Glad if you would get... Yes, it's the same exactly. What infernal impudence. I'd like to use my stick on the fellow. What should we do about it? Go. This isn't an invitation, it's an ultimatum. But what's the point of it? Heaven knows. Some gigantic bluff, probably. we have to wait till three o'clock and then we'll see. Well, Mr. Luca, what we're all here. Except the old lady. She'll come. What are you going to do, Luca? Confess? That it suit you, Field, would not it? Remember me, Mr. Godolphin? Indeed I do. You were Robert Mandrigal's Batman, an inefficient servant. Oh, this is silly. It's no good sitting here insulting each other. Now you've got us here, Mr. Luca. Do for heaven's sake say what you've got to say. That's not quite the line to take with me, me proud beauty. That'll do from you. That'll do from the lot of you. I've got you, and you know it. But I'm going to put the position to you so clearly that you can't make any mistake. I'm only waiting for Mrs. Ivory. In that case, we may as well go home. Is Granny likely to come all the way up here just because you've asked her to? It's cheek of you to ask her. Appalling cheek! Hold it, Duchess. Here she is. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Luca, is it? Thank you, Dorothea. I'll sit here. Yes. Now, what have you got to tell us that you feel we might find interesting? Perhaps you'll explain, first of all, Luca, what the devil you mean by cutting and running the moment poor Madrigal was found dead. Didn't you realize you'd have the police after you like a pack of hounds? Not very politely asked, but I'll answer you. I went before I knew he was dead. Anyone can tell you that. Why did you go then? Oh, very simple. The night before the discovery, I happened to hear that a certain collector in London was interested in the Gaylord Venus. Uh, that information came into this office and... Uh, I saw an opportunity of doing myself a bit of good. I couldn't find Madrigal, so I went down to the bank, drew out all the cash I had, and nipped on a boat for New York. Without telling a soul? Of course. In a deal of that sort, the fewer people you tell, the better. Why did you come back, then? Simple again. The news about Madrigal's death came through on the radio in mid-ocean. I put two and two together and sent a wire to the police that I was coming back. They met me off the boat. Mr. Luca, I really don't see why you had to take your own money. The information on which you acted was the gallery's property. Never mind that, Miss Dorset. I don't imagine Mr. Luca asked us here to discuss a piece of very ordinary business chicanery on his part. Once again, Mr. Luca, why are we here? Well, you know, I thought we all ought to have a little chat. You see, I've got my position to think of. Your position. That's right. The governor's coming back, isn't he? And I may decide to stay with the firm. I don't think we understand you, Luca. Well, that's a pity, Field. I rather hoped you would. You particularly. I'm afraid I don't, all the same. Oh, you don't? Then I'll tell you. You're in a jam, aren't you? All of you. While I was out of the country, I was a good enough scapegoat. Well, now I'm back. I've had a little talk with the police and they've shown they're not interested in me. You see where I'm leading? My freedom puts a rope round you. Don't you kid yourselves it isn't there. And don't you imagine the police are going to sleep. There's a lot of work being done on the quiet. A lot of little odds and ends of information are finding their way onto the superintendent's desk. But so far... They haven't had all my contributions. You're suggesting we don't want the police to find Robert's murderer. One of you doesn't. One of you here killed Madrigal. That's why you're here. Well, now you know where you stand. So far, I'm not telling any more of what I know than is necessary to clear myself. And if everything goes off as I intend it shall, I shan't feel called upon to say any more. I thought I'd tell you all together, so no one makes any mistakes. Put me onto the police. Wait a minute, Godolphin. You're not the only pebble on the beach. Let the others have a say. Does everybody here want me to talk? Well, now's your opportunity. No, sit down, Mr. Godolphin. When the time comes, we'll call the police. 
Someone's seen the light. It's bluff. Pure bluff. There's no earthly reason why the thing shouldn't have been done from outside. Or why it should have been. I suppose you're one of the people who think they saw a black man. I didn't give any opinion about that idea, because I wasn't asked for it. I'm much more interested in certain other little things. The music hall song, for instance. <laughs> what, no one amused? That's a funny thing. It's a famous old song. No one's going to kiss that girl but me. Well, you know how it goes. Pride of Idaho. So now you know. And when you go, you'll find there's something on her mind. Don't think it's you, because no one's going to kiss that girl but me. Don't you get it, anybody? Let me whistle it to you. <gasps> the whistle on the telephone. Was that it? Philida, what are you talking about? I haven't been told about this. Ah, oh, so you recognise it, do you? Miss Dorset, I'm speaking to you. You seem to have heard that tune whistled before. Yes. Yes, I have. It was about eight months... No, nearly a year ago... A call came through for Mr. Madrigal here at the office. It, it was foreign and sort of constrained. Something about it made me curious, and, and I listened for a moment or two. That was all I heard. Just the tune whistled like that. Then Mr. Madrigal hung up. He went out at once, and he didn't come back all day. I never saw him quite the same after that. Miss Dorset, that doesn't sound like you. I mean, that, it's a fantastic story. It's melodrama. Pull yourself together. What really happened? It's true. Philip. Yes, it is. It often happened. Or at least he thought it did, and it became an obsession with him. He used to dream about it. I thought he was out of his mind. And when I told Granny, she thought I was mad. And now Miss Dorset's telling you, and you're looking at her as if she was mad. Quick, <laughs> somebody. Philip, stop it. Stop it, stop it. All right, all right, all right. No need to go off the deep end, Philip. You all say it did happen, I'll accept it. I knew Robert pretty well, though, and I can't say I saw him as a nervous wreck. You saw he wasn't pulling a leg? Oh, you're on the wrong tack entirely there. Why'd you say that? Robert had changed. Last time I saw him, that's exactly how I should have described it. A nervous wreck. I only heard it once. You said that, Miss Dawson. Yes, but I always knew when it happened, by the way he behaved. It was only last summer he began talking so wildly about it, and I began to think he was insane. There's nothing insane about it if Miss Dawson heard it, too. Exactly. That's my point. Well, there you are. That's all I'm telling you at the moment, but I've got a hunch it's going to be enough. You can ring up the police, any of you. But all I say is, make sure your best friend wants you to. Well, now, I won't detain you. I dare say you'll all feel like a little discussion without me. I'm sorry I can't offer you this room, but I'm going to be busy. However, the rest of the mausoleum is at your disposal. Miss Dorset, I'll have a cup of tea here at 4.15. Mr. Luca, here's your tea. Can I come in? Mr. Luca? Mr. Luca, I've been knocking. Oh! Ah! Help! Help! Mr. Luca's dead! Ah! 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 Mrs. Madrigal, the poor silly thing. No warmth yet. Her hands like a stone. Doctor, what's she done? This can't be just fright, can it? Can't it? She's had the equivalent of a kick over the heart. And there's nothing like emotion to upset the circulatory system. Will she be all right? I think so. The only real danger at the moment is from infection. She'll need constant watching. You mean she can't be moved to a nursing home? No, of course she can't. But can't we have a couple of good nurses here? I'll see what I can do. Perhaps we could just have a word or two. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, shall we go outside? I think we'd better. 
Now, uh, Mrs. Madrigal's collapse occurred immediately after she heard the news of Mr. Lucas' death, didn't it? Yes. Who told her? You? I'm afraid I did. I thought she'd merely fainted. I called Dorothea and we got her onto the bed. Then I saw her forehead was wet and realized how cold she was. That was when I got onto you. I see. We've been having a sort of family conference. Mr. Luca called it himself in my father's office in the gallery next door. When it was over, most of us stayed there for a bit. In the building, I mean. But Philida felt rotten, so Mr. Godolphin brought her back here at once. Look here, this isn't quite ordinary inquisitiveness, but there is one point I would like to know. What's that? Is there any connecting door between this house and the gallery? Yes. It's my father's own door. No one else ever dreams of using it. Where is it? It opens from the back of the cupboard in my father's bedroom, and it leads into his office. Where Mr. Luca died? Yes. I suppose it was kept locked? It was bolted from this side. Who occupies your father's room now? My grandmother. But when Mr. Luca died, she was over in the gallery. Hmm. Well, it's all extremely awkward. I shall have to make some sort of explanation to any nurse who comes, and we don't want anyone second rate. Uh, may I use your telephone? Oh, please do. There's one in the hall. Oh, sorry. Look here. Take my advice and lie down for an hour or so. Mm, I think I will. I'll be in my room. If I don't come and disturb you, it means the nurse is okay. All right? Thank you, Doctor. You're very kind. Doctor? It's not the doctor, miss. It's me, Dorothea. Oh, come in. I've just heard something I think you ought to know before anyone else. Poor Mr. Field. What's happened to him? Oh, be brave, my dear. They've got him. Oh, no. Uh, Molly got it out of the policeman on duty at the back door. They found his address and sent and took him down to the station. Poor Mr. Field. You won't believe it, will you? No, no, of course not. Oh, heaven. Ah, no, no, don't sit there moping. You won't do no good that way. Is Granny asleep? Not when I left her. Very active she is. These things seem to stimulate her. You go and see her, dear. She'll make you feel better. I'll be seeing after Mrs. Madrigal. Nobody's looking after that poor doctor. He must think this place is a madhouse. Francis, can I come in, Granny? Yeah. Granny, it's too awful. David! Hello, Duchess. For goodness sake, keep your voice down and shut the door. But I just heard that you'd been arrested. He was. But he seems either to have been let out or to have escaped. Oh, never mind about me. I've been asking Mrs. Ivory to shut the house, split up, pack the servants off. If Philida's ill, let her go to a nursing home. You can go to a hotel. Mrs. Ivory herself can return to Hampstead. Get the house empty. What, tonight? Oh, Lord, yes, it must be tonight. But, David, we can't. The police wouldn't let us. There's one on duty in the front hall now and another on the back door. Didn't you see them as you came in? No, I didn't come that way. I heard his tapping at the cupboard. I thought it was the police, so I let him in. He has not cared to explain how he came to be in my son's private office. But in any case, his suggestion is quite impossible. And if it weren't, I should still stay. There is something I want to know. I hope you're not thinking of turning detective, Mrs. Ivory. No, but I'm a very inquisitive old woman. And in all this dreadful business, there is one thing which strikes me as very strange indeed. What's that? First Madrigal, you poor wretched creature, is found dead with a wound in his chest. And then that abominable little baggage man dies in the same way. As far as any reasonable person can see, both crimes must have been committed by the same person, who is still either in this house or in the gallery next door. Well, we're all agreed on that. Ah, one moment. The thing that seems to me so extraordinary is this. Both houses have been searched over and over again, and no weapon has been found. Now, I find this so peculiar that I've given my mind to it, and an idea has occurred to me which may eventually explain a number of things. May we ask what it is? No. I am not going to tell you or anyone else, because if I'm wrong, then I have made a very serious and unjust mistake. So I shall stay here until I find out for myself. Now, what is the matter, Mr. Field? That's a very dangerous statement. Have you made it to anyone else? Have you? No, I have not. But you come to me with a suggestion, and I am explaining to you why I am not adopting it. And now, forgive me, I am tired. 
Francis will take you downstairs. Mrs. Ivory, you mustn't. For goodness sake, think of everybody else. One more day. One more day. David, what did she mean? One more day. Keep your voice down. Now, quickly, is there a fire escape to this house? Oh, David, no. Oh, sorry, Duchess, but it can't be helped. Where's the boat hole? Oh, up the back stairs, onto the roof, then over the parapet to the next house. The gallery? No, the other way. It's only offices, so there's no one there. The ladder goes down at the back. You'll have to drop the last eight feet. Oh, be careful. Come with me. Where? Holland. God knows what I'm letting you in for, but come and we'll risk it. It's pure selfishness on my part. Why? Oh, darling, at such a time. Are you coming? Oh, how can I? Phyllida's is ill. Granny's alone. I can't. I must stay with them. Yes. Yes, of course. Francis, be careful. Don't hear anything. Don't think anything. Turn yourself into a mindless vegetable and keep your grandmother quiet. Never let her be left alone, not for a minute. You're going to Holland? Oh, damnation. I shouldn't have told you that. That's the one thing you must never tell anyone. Never whatever happens. I promise. Word of honor. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Word of honor. Goodbye. They broadcast an unfortunately good description of him in the 10 to 12 news last night. Silly chap, he can't help to get away with it. Oh, please! Oh, good Lord, sorry, Francis. Wouldn't have mentioned it if I'd known. I understood that engagement of yours was a put-up job. It started as one. It isn't now. Oh, this room's so stifling. Can't we pull back the shutters? Want to have all those crowds staring at us? I'm not an animal in the zoo. I like my breakfast in peace. Francis. Yes? You're kidding yourself, you know. I'm not. Oh, yes, you are. You're so young, you don't realise it. Love does get one, but there's nothing in it. You get bored to tears with that chap field if you know him for long. He's a painter. All painters have a sort of romantic glow about them, but they're silly, oversensitive beggars when you get to know them. Impractical, too. Oh, look at this wild flight of his. What's he got to fear? There's not a shred of evidence against him the police could prove. You're well rid of him. Oh, hello, Miss Dorsey. I made Dorothea come down. She must eat something or she'll drop. You've got some coffee, Norris says. Yes, I'll pour you some, Dorothea. Who's with Granny? The nurse. Mrs. Madrigal's asleep. I only wish her grandmother was. I don't think she's closed her eyes once all night. She's overexcited. I thought she was going to fly out of bed when the police asked if Miss Dorset could come through the cupboard door. Your coffee, Dorothea. Why did you come that way, Miss Dorset? Well, the inspector thought it would be better if I avoided the street. The crowd's waiting, hoping to see a woman. Me? My dear, it's Mr. Field running away. They don't think, you know. They just get hold of a dramatic idea. Never mind, it's going to be all right. What do you mean? Mr. Medic's been released and he's on his way. Daddy! Oh, thank heaven. I've just heard, so I had to come over. When will he be here? Any time after four. Oh. I nearly broke down and cried when I saw the message. It's what I've been praying for. Do you mind if I join you for a wee minute? Well, come in, Mr. Bridie. Uh, will you have a cup of coffee? No, not for the moment, thank you. Any news of field yet? Not a word of him, that silly young juggins. Do you think you'll get him? Oh, yes. No doubt about that. It's just a question of time. It's a dickens of a job to escape us. It's those wretched journalists who are the bother. Most tenacious chaps. There was one on the roof just now, and no young lady to help him either. <laughs> well, cheer up. It's a fearful business, but we're nearing the finish. I'd like to think so. There's absolutely no question about it. There's just a little anxiety for the next few hours, but you'll be able to sleep easy in your beds tonight without a chance of being murdered there. Can you say that definitely, Inspector? Quite definitely. Four o'clock, that's the hour. We'll all know a great deal more about this jiggery-pokery by then. Oh, uh, by the way, Miss Dorset, for your information, all the telephone lines in this house and the next have been tapped for some time. Right. I don't know why you should have to say that, I'm sure. Four o'clock, then. That's zero hour, is it? That's correct. And what are we to expect in the meantime? Nothing, please God. But I'll ask you all to be in the drawing room half an hour before that, as I have a few things to say to you. Everyone? Servants and all. Not old Mrs. Ivory. I'd very much like her there. No, she shan't. She's old. Her mind's not right. She'll work herself up and say things she doesn't know she's saying. You'll ask her down here over my dead body. No, that's a wee bit rash of you, Miss Dorothea, because I've already asked her earlier this morning. Really? I explained to her that you'd be here yourself to look after her. Oh, uh, Miss Dorset, are you leaving us? Well, I was going back to the gallery. There's a lot of work waiting. All right, then. We'll see you here at 3.30. Oh, you'll hardly need me. Just the same. I'd like you to be here. 
But I have an appointment just after 3.30. If you were thinking of meeting Mr. Merrick's train, I'll have to ask you to change your mind. Ah, I see there's an extension telephone in the corner. I'll arrange for all your business calls to be put through here. Very well. All right, then. Now we know where we are. Do what you like, but don't try and leave the house. And I'll expect you all in the drawing room punctually at half past three. Well, now, I'm not proposing to keep you all here in silence, so I've decided to give you a sort of general lecture on the two crimes. And when I come to any bit I'm not so sure about, perhaps you'll give me your intelligent cooperation. Will you do that? All right. It sounds an admirable plan, Mr. Bryder. Thank you, Mrs. Ivory. Now, since you're none of you professionally skilled in the art of investigation, I'll commence my observations with a few general remarks. I want you to get into your heads a half-finished jigsaw puzzle. You can see by the shape of the hole which is left that you need a human head to complete the picture. <laughs> a human head with a recognizable face. Oh, dear. Uh, what's that, Miss Dorset? Nothing, nothing. Please go on. The missing pieces of the puzzle are held by different individuals, and as soon as they're all on the table together, the little juts and corners will begin to fit and the face will gradually appear. It's, it's jolly ingenious. Jolly good work, sir. However, the first thing to do is to define the outline of the head. The background of the picture has to be built up, and the main art of this piece of construction is to weed out all unnecessary matter. Uh, maybe I'm too complicated for you? On the contrary. We find you extraordinarily clear. Go on. I'm glad to hear it, ma'am. We'll now descend to the particular. A fortnight ago, Mr. Robert Madrigal was found dead. And on the same day, Mr. Henry Luca sailed for New York. As soon as he received word of the occurrence, he returned home and was examined by me and I accepted his alibi. The next day, he called a conference of his friends and relations of Mr. Madrigal and was himself mysteriously murdered by the same weapon which had killed his chief. We now cut out the unnecessary factor. The murder of Henry Luca does not merit our serious consideration. Why do you say that? Because he was a blackmailing scoundrel. We have evidence that during his lifetime, Robert Madrigal paid out considerable sums of money which coincided in amount and date with sums paid into Luca's account. What about the slashing of David's picture? That and other incidents before it were Luca's way of showing Mr. Madrigal that he was serious in some new and iniquitous demand. What was his hold over Robert? We don't know. But we do know that when he returned, he shared an almighty secret with someone else. He knew who had killed Madrigal, you see. When he called that conference yesterday afternoon, he made that fact jolly plain to someone in the room, and within an hour, he was dead himself. That's a simple story. What about the motive for murdering Madrigal? Ah, that's the first piece of the puzzle we need. The textbooks tell us there are 17 motives for murder, but I've never bothered my head about more than three. Love, money, and revenge. And the principal one in my experience is money. It'll probably surprise one or two of you to hear that you all had the best money motives in the world for killing Madrigal. Well, 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 I'm I'm very very Why do you say that, Mr. Bride? He was ruining you all. Unless something drastic was done, he'd have steered the firm into liquidation. From the very first, he'd proved a dangerous and unbusinesslike person. Isn't that so, Miss Dorset? Yes, yes, from the beginning. Mr. Merrick Ivory did his best to, shall we say, divert Mr. Madrigal's attention by persuading him to go on an overseas journey. But when he returned, he undid much of the good work that had been done in his absence. His wife did her best to reason with him. Then, when Mr. Merrick Ivory had to go abroad himself, things became worse than ever. Right, Miss Dorset? You don't know what it's been like. Quite so. Now, a great firm has as many traditions as a great school or a great regiment, and it often inspires the same kind of jealous loyalty. I only mention this because there were quite a number of people who knew the real state of affairs. And Miss Dorset knew, of course, and so did Mrs. Madrigal. So did you, Mrs. Ivory, unless I'm mistaken. 
Yes, I knew. And it wouldn't surprise me to hear that you confided your worries to your lifelong personal attendant. She did. I knew about it. And you, Norris? Uh, me, sir. Yes, you. You've been in service here for 20 years. Maybe the situation was not unknown to you. I, uh, I have enjoyed Mr. Merrick's confidence for a number of years, sir. Uh, I think I did know a little uh, of this matter. Ah. Mr. Merrick, he knew. He was the principal person involved. He went off to China. That is to say, he left England 14 weeks before Madrigal met his death. Now, when I was a young man, China was as far away as the stars. But with the coming of the new aeroplane, distance had ceased to exist, as you might say. Let me read you a few interesting facts. From Hong Kong to Bangkok, the flying time is only 14 hours. From Bangkok to Calcutta, only nine and a half. From Calcutta to Karachi, nine... I protest. And... He's not here to defend himself. I'm only showing you how these You're days... You're not. It... You're making imputations. Take your call, Miss Dorset. Yes. Yes. Miss Dorset, yeah. Yes, I did inquire. Messrs. Ivory, Limited, Savitt Square. Yes. Yes. Yes, I see. Thank you. Well, did you get your answer? Yes. And your suspicions were correct? I... Um, oh, I don't know. Don't ask me. Poor body. We now have to consider the night of the crime. The last person known to have seen Robert Madrigal alive is David Field. You all know what happened. There was an argument between the two in the garden room. According to the evidence, Madrigal turned to Field and said... You've waited a long time for a woman with money, and now you're not taking any chances, are you? Not a very nice observation. How like him. David hit him, I suppose. He did. He hit him on the jaw, scraping his own knuckles and putting the man clean out for an instant on the floor. At least, that's Field's story. But Miss Frances Ivory, who happened to be in the yard about that time, or a few seconds later, said she saw the two of them talking. Would you like to retract that statement, Miss Ivory? It's very clear why you made it. Yes, I, I would. Well, this method of sifting evidence is unorthodox, but it's remarkably efficient. We're getting on very nicely with our afternoon's diversion. The shape of the head is taking place before our eyes. Now, Field went into the hall and fetched Madrigal's hat and coat for him. The idea was to take him to a doctor and have him patched up. Then he went upstairs to say good night to his young lady. Then, he says, he came down and heard Madrigal talking to someone and, thinking it was Lucar, turned away. That is Field's statement. And you may feel, as I do, that it's highly unsatisfactory. Still, he admits handling the hat and coat, and that is highly significant. Anyone might have seen him do it, and this whole story might have been an invention of his to cover that contingency. One thing is clear to me, that the murderer threw the hat and coat into the cupboard after the dead man. No, you're wrong there. What makes you think that, Mrs. Ivory? I know you are, because I put the hat and coat over the poor wretched man myself. You didn't. You didn't. You don't know what you're saying. Be quiet, Dorothy. I told you she'd come out with things she didn't mean. Don't believe her. Don't you dare believe her. My dear Dorothea, you don't really think I killed him, do you? No. Oh, please sit down. The inspector is doing his puzzle, and I must contribute my piece. Will you tell us what happened, ma'am? Certainly. I went downstairs that night. It was my first evening in my old home, and I was restless. Dorothea had left me sitting by the fire. And I got up and walked about the room and found I was much stronger than I had supposed. I made up my mind I would go down to Robert and talk to him. It was dark but I know every inch of this old house, and I paused in the hall to listen. It was quite silent, but I saw the garden room door was open with a light on inside. So I went along there. I shouldn't have left you. I shouldn't have oh, left you. Oh, do be quiet, Dorothea. The blinds were down, and at first I thought the room was empty. And then I saw the cupboard door was slightly open. Open? 
Are you sure of that, ma'am? Yes, slightly open. I went over and looked inside. Poor fellow. So undignified and grotesque. Did you touch him? Touch him? Of course not. It was perfectly obvious the man was dead. I have seen death too often to mistake it. I went across the room and I sat down to think. It was an awkward situation. Francis is a young girl. Philida a neurasthenic. Obviously, none of us was capable of handling the scandal of a police inquiry. I decided that Robert must wait until my son could return to see to things. Great heavens. And then I saw the hat and coat. Naturally, it occurred to me at once that if Robert vanished with his outdoor clothes, no one would look for him in the house. I placed them on his body quite reverently. And then I closed the door, using my shawl to cover my fingers. And then I rested a little and went back to my room. I told Dorothea to cable my son, but I didn't tell her the rest. But what a ghastly secret to keep to yourself all those days, ma'am. If you had lived when I did, my dear man, you'd have learned how to keep a great many secrets. That is what disgusts me about this present age. You have no mental discipline. A great many people sneer at the Victorians. But no other period had our face. I believe you, ma'am. No, Wait, I... I have not finished yet. Some of your puzzle is filled in, Inspector, but there are still several pieces missing, and one of them is this. If Luca went away before he knew of Madrigal's murder, why on earth did it go at all? Oh, it's quite all right, officer. I'm very glad I'll go straight in. That's Daddy's fault. Mr. Oh, Merrick, oh. at last. Hello, everyone. Sorry I got held up. Nothing yes. I could do. Mm. Hello, Godolphin. Hello, Millie. I heard you were back. Good to see you. Francis. Oh, Daddy, we've missed you. Bless you. Mother. Oh, oh my poor dear darling. How are you? Merrick. Oh, Zero hour. Sorry, sir, no one to be admitted. He's expecting me, officer. It's quite all right, I assure you. That's David. Here I am, Inspector. Just made it. Well done, Mr. Field. And what's your news? It was the one with the smallest moustache. Yeah. Here's the picture. What is this? The smallest Inspector, what's Field talking about? What's that photograph he's got? Can't we know what's happening? All in good time, sir. All in good time. Let me just go back for a moment to Mrs. Ivory's question. Why did Luca run away? Exactly. That puzzled you all, hasn't it? Well, do you remember what else happened that day? The, the papers came out with the news of Godolphin's rescue. That's it. How do I come into it? Just possibly Mr. Luca was afraid of confronting you. That's an interesting theory. Why should he be? I'd like you all to have a look at this photograph that Mr. Field brought with him. Indian in a turf. I told you so. It's the man Molly saw. Mr. Godolphin, do you recognize that photograph? <laughs> I see someone's been decorating my portrait. Your work, I suppose, Phil. Very amusing, but what's the point? Five people at Amsterdam Airport recognized it as the passenger who arrived there on the day that Robert was murdered and who took the five o'clock plane out again the following morning. I'm sorry, Dolly, but you could have done it in the time. <laughs> Can any European remember the difference between two Indians? Like one or two other people, Miss Dorset became suspicious when she discovered that Mr. Godolphin, who left England penniless, had returned from an unsuccessful expedition with money enough for diamonds and motor cars. Come on, Miss Dorset, don't be frightened. Tell us what you found out when the Nestor Traders Association phoned you just now in response to your inquiry. I found... Um... I found that the Bank of India had guaranteed him up to £90,000 on the surety of someone called Habib ul Raput. Well, that's partly true. Raput Habib of Penang is a good friend of mine. I did him a service and he guaranteed me when I came home. But I'm afraid you're not going to get my face fitting into your infernal puzzle. Why on earth should I go to these energetic lengths to kill Robert in England? If I'd wanted to do the tick in, I'd have had much more opportunity in Tibet. Hang it, I saved his life, didn't I? Did you? Did you? Well, surely you heard the story from Robert, Mrs. Ivory. I did, and I wondered. Wondered? Yes. In my time, I have met the kind of man who sacrifices himself to save his friends. And he has not been your kind, Mr. Godolphin. I see. You don't believe that I broke my leg up there in the mountains? Oh, yes. Robert could never have made that up. He told it too vividly. What I wonder is 
whether you really made your heroic sacrifice or whether you did nothing of the kind. I wonder if it was really a story of great cowardice. I wonder if Robert left you. I wonder if he gave you a blanket and a tin or two of provisions and left you screaming to him in the snow. I wonder if he dragged Lucar on with him and when they returned to safety, remembered the magnificent story of gallantry to cover his own cowardice. And I wonder if that was the hold Luca had over him, Mr. Godolphin. Witchcraft! A genuine witch at last! Well, suppose you're right. Prove it. Prove he left me. Prove I froze and starved and rotted till a gang of priests picked me up. Prove that I came back to England with Raput Habib's papers. Prove I hid in a shed in the yard. Prove I killed Robert. Prove I killed Luca when he got us all together and whistled Little Dolly Daydream, the song he tortured Robert with until to kill him was an act of charity. Prove I killed him, Mrs. Clairvoyant Gabrielle. What with? With your stick. My husband had one just like it. It is a sword stick. You're not lame at all. Right again, witch. Now, out of my way, all of you. I'll cut you to ribbon. Oh, no, you don't. Out of my way. Come here, but... he'll cut your arm off. Leave him to my men outside. Now then, sir. Out of my way. Get hold of him. Bring him down. Come on, now. You can't get past us. Damn you. Ah! He's in the street. Open the windows. <laughs> He's through them. He's running for it. Get after him. That taxi. He hasn't seen it. Ironic, isn't it? Risks his life all over the world and then gets knocked into the next one by a London taxi. <laughs> Do you want to go in? Not yet. It's restful out here. Poor old Dolly. He had great provocation. And guts, too. Did Phyllida guess, do you think? I'm sure she did. You knew, too, didn't you? Yes, I knew. When? That night he called us over to their table and accused me. Do you remember? He worked himself up describing the scene and suddenly gave himself away. How? He talked about Robert's grey lock flapping in front of his eyes. Now, Robert went grey in the last six months of his life, he told me so. As soon as Dolly mentioned it, I knew he was describing a picture he'd really seen. I was so startled, I thought he'd seen it in my face. Where did you get the picture of Godolphin? From the foreman of the framing department. He keeps a collection of celebrities. I worked on the theory that when Molly said a black man, she might mean a high-caste Indian whose ancestors were discussing theology while her own were leaping from twig to twig. I was busy with my paints and things when the police came. I'm no hero, you know. I spilt every bean I had. Cholly good job. Believe me enough to let me go and see your grandmother, but he wouldn't hear of me going off to the Dutch airport. That's why I had to cut and run for it. Did they trace you? No, I don't think they even missed me. <laughs> that was rather degrading. I phoned Bridie from Amsterdam, and he sent over a couple of men to do the dirty work, interviewing these stewards and so on. I was pleased with myself when I got back, I can tell you. Trust your granny to steal the thunder, though, by exposing the sword stick. Oh, that was incredible. It was also very neat on Godolphin's part. As long as you think a man's lame, you expect him to carry a stick with him. Well? Well? It's on our minds, isn't it, Ducky? <laughs> I suppose so. What are you going to do? Invest your poor mamma's fortune in the grand old firm and bestow yourself on the lowly and not impoverished painter, setting forth in April for a new world with the dawn in its radiance, beckoning you to a fresh and glowing love life. <laughs> I think you're abominable. Are you going to? You'd have the shock of your life if I didn't. That was Marjorie Westbury as Gabrielle Ivory, Patrick Barr as Dolly Godolphin, Monica Gray as Francis Ivory, and Duncan McIntyre as Divisional Detective Inspector Bridie, in Black Plumes, a play for radio by Felix Felton and Susan Ashman from the novel by Marjorie Allingham. With John Pullen as David Field, Mary Wimbush as Phyllida Madrigal, David March as Henry Luca, Betty Hardy as Miss Dorset, Godfrey Kenton as Robert Madrigal, Ella Milne as Dorothea, Norman Claridge as Merrick Ivory, Timothy Harley as Norris, 
Glyn Dearman as a doctor, Hamlin Benson as P.C. Withers, Arthur Lawrence as P.C. Randall. The production, which was recorded, was by Audrey Cameron. <laughs> <laughs>